Okay, welcome to the AI recitation. Uh, AI, on one way to measure it, has been progressing smoothly and continuously. On another, has been going through boom-bust cycles. And right now, we're in a boom cycle. This one is very dramatic. It's disrupting almost everything, uh, including us, and is pointing to a future where we may not need either students or teachers in the class, since both can be obsoleted. And so to talk about the opportunity, challenges, and threats, we have a fabulous group. So uh, we're first going to start with a, a group of grad students from MIT, uh, Val, Damira, and Olivia. Uh, then we'll go to Cesar and the Fab Network, and then we'll go to uh, one of the AI leads at Zoom. And as always, these are interactive post um, comments, questions in the chat. So, uh, Val, take over. All right. Well, um, hello, everyone. Let's uh, let's get started. So, uh, this lecture, as Neil, uh, you know, introduced, is how to make almost anything almost without making anything, implying that AI will uh, hopefully assist us in the workloads um, of making things. So, first of all, um, you've probably heard this many times before, uh, without AI, you will, you know, be left behind. If you don't learn it now, you will be left behind. If you don't learn it now, you will be left behind. This is a narrative that has exploded kind of recently, but when people use the term AI, what do they really mean? Uh, this is something we will dive into here. Um, for the most time, they're talking about something called large language models. Um, and large language models uh, is something you might be familiar with if you've ever used things like ChatGPT. It's essentially uh, a huge um, model that have learned to predict the next words uh, in a sequence of words. And since it's been trained on all of the data on the internet, it's getting really good at predicting the next word. Um, and this leads to some people using uh, these in something called an agent where it not only predicts the next word, you know, if you give it a task like write an essay uh, or write me some code, but you can also connect it to uh, what's called tools that allows it to, um, to decide, you know, something to use and then use it. And then the things that it gets will be fit, fed back into it. And it can kind of uh, use that information in a, um, closed loop fashion. To give an example, um, people have built, you know, systems like ChatGPT, but that have access to web search. So it can search the internet, then it gets the results of its internet search. And then it can, you know, with that new information, uh, continue reasoning about that um, and produce new sequences of words. Um, or for instance, in the fabrication content, you know, you could have a uh, large language model that is capable of, you know, sending a file to a 3D printer and then based on the result of the 3D printer, it will sort of get that information back and can tell you how that went. Or the system can write code and then execute the code and then based on if the code is successful or, or, or has a failure, it gets the result and it can reason about this. Um, this is kind of a new frontier and that's why we're sort of you know, bringing this in uh, as well, because this might be something that you're uh, excited about connecting to your fabrication uh, um, tasks that you're interested in. So here's just a case of uh, one of these agents thinking about something, defining its own tasks, then conducting a web search, taking the results back and thinking about it more. Um, and you can read more about this go if you read up on things like AutoGPT. Um, this is also something you can make very easily if you've ever tried the GPT's editor on, on uh, OpenAI. Uh, in, inside ChatGPT, you can, you can do this very easily. Um, and if you want a little bit more freedom, you can use something that's called the OpenAI Assistance API. Um, it's also very well documented, so just have a link to it here. Um, and if you want full control, you can use something called LangChain. Um, which helps you doing this too. Um, and if you wanna go completely open source uh, and not use OpenAI, there's this thing called Mistral, um, uh, this uh, company. 
So um, another thing that's also extremely exciting is in your fabrication projects, you can not only use language or words, um, you can also now use video. So I'm going to give an example of someone who used a uh, large language model in combination with images to uh, create this kind of uh, very fun uh, uh, David Attenborough AI clone. So it's essentially, it takes an image and then this image is fed to the large language model and it returns text. And then the text is, is run through uh, another model that changes the text to David Attenborough's voice. And here's an example. And now, as I move around, he... Here we have a remarkable specimen of Homo sapiens, distinguished by his silver circular spectacles and a mane of tousled curly locks. He is wearing what appears to be a blue fabric covering, which can only be assumed to be part of his mating display. <sighs> so, as you can see, you know, you have on the top corner the picture that it's looking at. Um, and yeah, um, it's very fun. And, you know, you can embed this into if you're building systems with cameras, you, all of a sudden you can build systems that have extremely, uh, uh, you know, ex, you know, detailed insights into what's happening. Um, and yeah, I have a link to this also uh, here at the bottom. And I'm sure Neil will share the slides later so you can try it out. It's very fun. Um, all right, so let's make each class almost obsolete um, using generative AI. So we'll go into three distinct categories, computer-aided design, then we'll go into 3D modeling, and then we'll um, end with kind of electronics design and programming. Um, all right, so first I will pass this on to Amira. Hi, everyone. Um, so yeah, so I was, I'm gonna talk today about like um, using large language models for uh, CAD and CAM. Um, so like basically in context of like the assignments that you uh, guys are going to do throughout the year, um, if you go to the next slide, um, I just wanted to, um, uh, sorry, can you do go to the next slide? Yeah. I just wanted to give like a disclaimer. Um, like here we're talking about how to go from text to kind of to CAD or CAM, like, uh, um, and, uh, in, in in general, there's like a lot of research on, on like how they how they train to go from text to um, like given like large um, data uh, trained from text to CAM or but like this is using GANs and transformers, but we're not going to be talking about that. So we'll be basically talking about large language models and chat GPT in particular. Uh, and, and this works uh, that the large language models goes from text to code. Um, and this is kind of um, because there's like, um, it, it's well trained to go from text to code. And then manually, we kind of use a go from code to the CAD like environment. Uh, and this is using like either you create your own language, um, uh, which I'm gonna show, or you can also use other APIs like CAD open source APIs or other APIs in Python. Um, so you can go from the code to the CAM manually in, in a like separate uh, process afterwards. Um, so if you go to the next slide, kind of um, the first like, kind of experiments we we were working on was was like how to give in your own language. So you give it, for example, here we're asked just GPT to uh, we tell it there's a function box that like gives you the center of the box. You give it the center of the box and the dimensions. And you wanted to we you wanted to see the spatial reasoning ha happening behind um, ChatGPT if you ask it to create um, um, like a simple box. So here it created a simple box. Then if you go next, if you just uh, then um, you can ask GPT using this like function that you just learned. Uh, can you create a table that has four chairs? And as you can see, actually ChatGPT was able to um, to understand what this chair is and what is. A table and that they, they're created of different boxes and it was able to uh, gen generate the thing. Of course, it only generates like the function on the right. Uh, and, and like I manually like use, like kind of visualize what's happening uh, just to see like if it's correct or not. 
uh, here the scale was not correct, so I asked ChatGPT to um, ChatGPT to fix the scale. It was able to fix the scale, but some other stuff like kind of doesn't work in the between. So you can see that kind of it's more like an iterative process. If you go again, like I fixed, I told it to fix like kind of the thing. To, so it's it's kind of it does work, but there's like a lot of things that could go wrong, and there's like still like there isn't like um because. Basically, the large language models only understand like the text. It doesn't like ha have any validation of what's happening. It, there isn't like a spatial reading, like kind of it doesn't know the cat. It just goes from it's a large language models that go from text to code. So so there is like a lot of things to kind of but like once you have the code, you can fix it. But like it's not like uh, an automated process that would happen like right away. Um, if you go to the next slide. This uh, this one, for example, uh, I asked it to create a simple cabinet using um, OpenGS CAD. This is like a um a open source uh, like a CAD environment and JavaScript. Um, and it's it was quite impressive that it was able to create the code with functions and hierarchy. It learned like hierarchy, it's parametric, so it can later change the code. Of course, I had to manually like fix some stuff. Like the code doesn't like sometimes the the it doesn't give you some of the uh, dependencies. So um, but like again the the code was very well structured. It's very, sh sh um, it was able to create like kind of uh, variables and param uh, in a parametric way and, and different functions. So you can add it the code later to change. So this could be a good starting point in the CAD, like um, in the, your like, CAD CADing workflow. Um, this one I thought was super interesting because um, I this this is using PyVista, which is a CAD um, um, library in Python. Uh, which um, I asked ChatGPT to create three bio-inspired, um, um, uh, like kind of um, fish. So uh, uh, ChatGPT, even though it doesn't have any like images, it's like it doesn't have any spatial reader, It created like a goldfish. It was like even the colors, the chosen colors, like it, it the code, the whole code is kind of um, like it was able to know like what is a goldfish, how does it look that it's created from a sphere and uh, like given the, the kind of constraints of the language. So um, that was quite in interesting. Um, and if you go next, um, uh, finally, like this is the new library that I found, um, I came across. So um, so this one, um, you can, it, it's able, so they created like an agent, um, trained using their own API. I think, I think it's like zoo.dev, they have the, their own like CAD. So you can here, you can like create like more CAD, it's, it's trained for the CAD. So it's like, um, and you can kind of write what you want and then download the right away. So you don't have to do the extra step of like having your own like kind of thing. Uh, of course, like here you on like download an OBJ, so you can't like actually edit later. So it's not like I, I prefer having a code that you can change later, but like it actually works better because it's like trained only to do from text to cat. So this is uh, if one someone wants to uh, play with it. Um, then going next to after you have a cat, like how do you go from or how do you use like ChatGPT to do more like CNC or like kind of machining or uh, or more um, a cam. Um, so, um, and then I, like here we were, uh, kind of the, like in your laser cutting assignment, um, is basically ask it to create like a, a geometric lamp that like kind of have, um, that is intricate enough, but also, um, uh, could create like kind of is from laser cut. So this is what it created. I, I manually created like kind of the, on the right, like the, I have like got the pieces and put it to be laser cut but it was able to do it it wasn't from the first time but it was able to know like how do that piece pieces intersect and and kind of remove the intersection so you can also use it for creating like laser cutting assignment um if you want it automatically um if you go next uh, next slide um to create like kind of a cut piece so here like for example the this is the maximum complexity I was able to do for the CNC uh, week. Um, so asking it to like giving it the wood stock, like what is the thickness and, and kind of one, I, I kind of pushed it to create like more intricate like joints, but it wasn't able. So this is kind of, but it, it basically created an SVG file that would give you the cut file that you give to the CNC machine right away. Um, and, and it was able to understand like that there, there's joints, the like kind of the thickness um, and and put like a, it could also label the things for you. Um, and if you go to the next slide, um, um, and 
basically you can only also use this like the large language models not only to create like cut files but also to ask it for like what is the optimum management sharing processes so if you give it like a code that describes the geometry and um and tell it like this is could should be made with, uh, for example with plastic or or kind of with um like different materials it would tell you for example yeah this should be done with the cnc machine or like the injection molded so you can ask it like kind of in brainstorming at the beginning or um, this is like these two images from a paper they they go more like I, I I usually check this paper out but I kind of also you can give it um, a text like a, a code for like for a geometry and ask it like if I want a CNC machine this can you fix can you tell me what is the potential problem so ChatGPT was actually um, able to understand like that the there's like parts that has small radius or the wall thickness. Um, so it it was able actually also to fix some of the stuff or like kind of to um to um show like there there's problems and and some of the designs. Um yeah. Um and finally this is this is more on like this uh, like verification of simulation. What if like you have a design but you want to verify that it works? Um and like until now, like you can't like kind of ask it like the the maximum for example of the chair is it like strong enough or not um so on the left like in here like if you ask it if, if um if this like chair is uh, able to withhold like 100 kilograms it was able to give you like kind of an an, an analytical description it didn't give like the it didn't show like where it got like the the real like formula so you have to trust it in the process but it was kind of able to reason that the chair there's like 100 kilograms where the forces are so you can use it in that direction or on the right if you want to do like faa and like um so you can ask it to generate the code to do the faa then you can like kind of interpret the the, the results um yeah finally i, I just wanted to then I, and like last slide to to just like and as a summary um it has like still has like a lot of things, but there's like a lot of limitation. It's able to understand spatial reasoning a bit, uh, constraints. There's iteration, which is very good. Like you have to kind of fix some of the stuff, which is good for debugging, um, as well as like for you're able to have, and it works very well for with modularity and hierarchy. So if you start with like, um, I, I found it like easier to start like kind of giving it a function and start like building on it. Like first, can you create a box? So you can can create a table. Can create two tables. Like going like it's 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 it understands better if you do that. The limitations, of course, like it it doesn't. There's no validation. It's not able to verify what's happening. And also in the scalability, like if you ask it too many stuff, like then the constraints like it forgets what happens before. Um. Um. And I believe like later, like when there's like more um training specialist training with like CAD or like kind of because all we're using are large language models without like specialized like kind of libraries or like kind of um giving more like data that's more CAD I think it's going to get better but it's like it kind of works now um yeah that's a that's it for them. cool so now let's uh dive a bit into uh the 3D scanning and 3D uh modeling part of the course so for those uh, who are familiar with 3D modeling, um, not using a CAD tool typically looks like this, which is extremely tough um, uh, and time consuming. But recently, uh, you know, there's been new approaches for this. So one is given images of things in the real world, can we construct a 3D model? And then the later, more perhaps like newer way of doing it is well, I will just type a text description of the object that I want, and then I will use uh, a generative AI model to build this thing for me. Um, so, you know, if you're interested in the whole writing some text and then getting an object out of it, um, there's this whole like uh, open source studio where, that has a bunch of models um, that you can use. Um, but there's also this. A uh, company called Genie, uh, Luma AI, that has the service called Genie, where you can essentially, in a matter of seconds, and we're going to try this right now. Hopefully, my the screen is shared, um, but um, yeah, let's try a monkey riding a sausage, and then within seconds, you will sort of get an output. Um, Oh, here's a monkey riding a sausage. So these are 3D objects that you can 
then download and you can 3D print it. You know, you can go back and change the prompt to something different. Um, and yeah, it's super useful. But uh, one of the limitations of these is that the quality, as you might see, um, is not super good of these uh, of these models. Um, so let me go back here again. Uh, okay, cool. So, um, okay. So uh, a project that actually started uh, in uh, in this class, the MIT version with Neil, was uh, trying to build a uh, model that can convert text into 3D uh, in such a way that it has high detail and it can become something real um, when it's 3D printed. And these are the results. Um, and here are some more results. So this is a salt shaker in the shape of an axolotl. Um, and this is a teapot made out of leaves uh, using this. And um, yeah, and it's available online if you want to try it. Um, you know, feel free to follow this link. Uh, okay, so one more thing is the electronics design. Typically, when we design electronics, we first try to figure out, you know, what are the things that we need? Um, then after we figure out what we want to do, uh, what we need, then we build the schematics, like which components, uh, how do I connect the different electronics components? Um, and the last thing is writing the, 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 the code itself that goes uh, onto the, the circuit board to enable all the functionality that I want. Um, typically, uh, you know, we have to read a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, text in order to figure out what are like how to connect the different components? What are the maximum temperatures and stuff like that? Uh, and it can be quite overwhelming. Thankfully, now you can chat using uh, these large language models with these PDFs and uh, expedite the process a little bit. So here's an example where I'm taking a data sheet of an ESP32. Um, and I'm simply just asking it, you know, what are the pin definitions? of it, um, and then it's taking me to the page, and I can even follow up with it and ask it where I can, uh, um, in this case, connect a temperature sensor. And it will give me the pins that uh, I might be able to use to do that. So that's super useful. Um, again, you can also ask ChatGPT to help you figure out like which pins you can connect. Um, uh, and it can also write the code for you. Um, but, you know, if if the LLMs can do all of these steps, why don't we just bundle it all up together? And so this is a project, whoops. So this is a project um, where we put it all together. So this is also open source and available. We put it all together. Um, and here, you know, you can just say something like, I want to monitor my greenhouse. And then it knows the components that you have and it can suggest something. Um, so here it says you can use a humidity sensor, which is what you have um, to read the humidity levels. Would you like to proceed? I say, yes. It tells me where to connect the different pins of the sensors to the Arduino Nano that I'm working with. So then I just do that. Um, and then when I'm done, then I just say, okay, I have connected the things. Um, and then it writes the code for me and uh, uploads the code to my board, which is connected to the computer. And then as you can see here, I just simply put the sensor in there um, and I read the result uh, from the humidity sensor. So super easy to use, uh, very fun um, and works for simple uh, designs. All right, um, I will skip this because we're low on time, but um, feel free to look back at this um, at a later section. OK, so I will pass it on to Olivia now. Thanks, Bald. So um, I'll take over the screen share. In the meantime, I'll just share a bit about how last semester we took this version of Fab Academy, um, but at MIT, to explore the question about whether or not an AI student can almost make things. And ultimately, I think as Vald and Amira have also shared, we kind of 
found out that while LLMs make it easier to produce artifacts and write code, it really only serves as a starting point for learning and exploration. We found that while it was sometimes inspiring, I think human discernment and creativity and collaboration cannot yet be replaced. Uh, but that's it. We also saw the potential of AI for simulating AI partners, collaborators, and teachers. And to this end, this recent research from last year showed how AI can simulate how pairs and groups of people can interact uh, to a surprising extent of reality. So uh, while this research simulated a casual environment, we, together with our AI student, tried to replicate this to build a fab lab environment. Let me show you. Welcome to the land of open. Sorry, I will show you how that looks like with sound here. So this is a fabrication lab that is um, open air, open AIR fab lab. I'm not sure if you can hear that, but that's Neil's voice. And so this is where we stored all of our week's assignments for the AI student. Um, and you can come over here to this URL to check it out. For our final project, we created this website, so the Open AIR Fabrication Lab. Um, and our student, AI Lean, uh, was the one who helped us to complete all the assignments. Um, we asked Eileen for a final project idea, and she proposed an indoor garden, but we wanted to take it to the next level. So with some of the AI student TA creativity, <laughs> we created together an AI Fab Knowledge Garden instead, together with AI TAs and AI Neil, otherwise known as Nail. Um, and if I can close this, I'll show you what it looks like. You can walk around and you can talk to the electronics bench, for instance, get some information on how to use it. You can also approach a TA like AI instructor Leo here and ask, um, how do I make a laser cut lion, for instance? and Leo will function as your TA and give you some helpful response, hopefully. There you go. So you can go back and forth just like you might on ChatGPT, but the difference here is that you can also talk to other students and collaborate that way. Um, you can feel free to come to this website to explore it, but it only works when the server is running. Otherwise, you can check out how it works on this video as well. So going back to my slides, um, we kind of wanted to touch a little bit on the limitations and ethics of using AI for fabrication. Um, as you might have encountered, AI doesn't always fully understand the context, the human context, and so this is something that we must always be conscious and wary of. Um, there are a lot of politics and controversy involved with using AI, and this is definitely something that you know, policy and laws are currently being updated, um, so we need to keep an eye on that. Once again, this is our conclusion from before, and we're so excited to see what kind of things you can do with some AI-empowered creativity. Well, thank you so much again from the three of us. Um, feel free to ask any questions. Great, thanks um, Val, Olivia, Amira, all uh, grad students at MIT doing this work, uh, both technically and yeah, posing these really provocative questions. When Val, did the print something assignment by asking um, ChatGPT for a serial teapot. It wasn't clear, did he do the assignment and who did the assignment? Um, uh, th these really interesting questions and challenges. And we'll be posting all of their slides afterwards. So there we're gonna go on to Cesar, who's representing a group in the Fab Lab network that loosely started picking up from Valdemir Olivia, but has been looking more broadly at what are the implications of AI and how we do what we do? So take over, Cesar. So, yeah. Hi, everyone. I hope you can uh, see my screen. So we are going to discuss about a group that launched at the, at the Instructor Bootcamp in Leon. Uh, and we were figuring out, OK, this, this project from uh, Bal, Olivia, and Amira was really cool. But how do we embed this into Fab Academy way of doing things. So we created a group that so far is called Fab Academy AI Lab. Uh, we plan to have bi-weekly meetings. So when these registration are not happening, we will be just meeting and keeping up with all the updates in the 
in the groups so far, everyone engages, well, was already on the instructor group. Well, we think it could be open to everyone in the network. So if anyone is interested, um, Hank launched last week on Mattermost channel. So there is this Power Academy AI lab at Mattermost. So if you are interested in what you're going to see, uh, feel free to, to join. So what uh, we have just a couple of meetings discussing what could be useful. And we have so far talked about getting the AI student that, that has its own GitLab account and content. We were also talking about customizing GPTs and mapping the solutions for generative AI, what, what can be done so far and try to keep it updated over the years. And even we thought about having Neil interviewing the students to figure out if he could answer properly answers about its own created website contents. So it could, we call this the Gersenfeld Turing test as a, you know, inspired by the, by the other, other Turing test. There's a lot to unpack on this line. So I'd like to take a couple of minutes to explain about the custom IGPT, some of the challenges, opportunities about the cuts and nots and how does it apply to the, to the AI world. So, uh, but also the custom GPT and also Amira try to customize. Um, so the first question could be, can we just take the Fava Academy archive and put it onto a GPT? It could be at the starting point, like creating the documents and try to have a simple way to work with this, but there is a limitation for the GPT for uh, GPT so far. So you can only fit up to 20 documents. Uh, otherwise, you need to unpack uh, maybe one archive per year, and then maybe it's grow bigger because the maximum size is like uh, 52 megabytes. So and some people have just realized that once you start putting tons of content into the GPTs, it starts to slow down. So maybe you need to create one GPT per session or try to split the content in a way to make sense. Uh, this could be like a good starting point to have like this kind of specialized assistant for each of the sessions where you can add your laser instructor or your CAD instructor to offer you some help based on all the previous knowledge of the available uh, Faber Academy archive. We were also uh, shown some of these uh, large language models like GPT-4 and right now there are tons of commercial of the self AIs like GPT-4, Gemini, Ultra that have been like released last week and you can get any of this, but there is the alternative of commercial of the self with open weights. And I think uh, Walter will be very happy to know about the Llama model for the <laughs> for from Meta that is available, as, of course, as a service. But there are also tons of Chinese models coming from Alibaba and even some models that help you code in better. So we were also figuring out, uh, can we tune this model to help the student perform better when they're creating? We were also discussing about the, the one of the things that Olivia covered in the last part about the ethics that it could be like required for students in the same way that they they document what they do. Maybe they could serve the prompts if they use the GPTs to document what they, they're doing. Um, one really good announcement, two weeks ago, uh, Allen Institute, it was like last like Friday, Allen Institute released uh, the first kind of op real open source model where everything is available weights, data, code, because there are tons of models that are offering you like the binary format, just the, the binary format. But right now there are models where the whole recipe is, is shared, like the weights, the data. So you can track if like copyrighted material was used to train the model or not. And this could be could lead to a more ethical way to train all these uh, future models. So in terms of what can be done, usually, we need to combine the following techniques. One is retrieval augmented generation, where we curate the contents we put into the LLM so it returns better knowledge or curates and just extract the relevant parts of the knowledge for us. But if we want, for example, to train these models to produce valid open SCAD code or other kind of more complex shapes, we need to uh, run also fine tuning techniques where we are providing like tons of examples so we can embed the knowledge into the model itself. So when we are thinking about training all these models and moving beyond the GPTs, we need to combine like curating the information, but also figuring out what parts need to be inside the model, like to, to gather knowledge about maybe geometrical parts and that kind of stuff. And what part needs to be taken from the outside because it doesn't make sense inside of the model itself. 
if you want to find out what models perform better, they are like um, right now all the models that perform better, the top ten are proprietary models. But if you want to find out what open models can you use, maybe for your practices, there is this open LLM leaderboard by Hugging Face, where you can find out in different benchmark what are the best models. So if you want to find what is the best model for logical reasoning or for getting truthful responses, you can go there and you can find out what is the best. And the download link is usually right there. So this is the main source when we decide about that and also regarding the site. And this is something that uh, we were also discussing, how can we make um, AI tools embedded into the process so the students can uh, document better, share information better. So one of the models that uh, is being used currently and it's quite impressive that it work is Whisper. So uh, this is a model that performs uh, speech to text conversion. So you can just press a button and say, hey, I'm taking this, this piece of cardboard into the laser cutter. My, my speed is that speed. This is the number of bats. And it will just get it down written for you. And for these people that are not native speaking, you can also make it like, you can record it in your own language and have the whisper model translated to English, to, to written English. So it might be useful when you are trying to document and you are in the, <laughs> in the flow state, like trying to make things forward, to have this, um, it's really, really useful. And it also works for 100 languages. So given that the FabLab network is all around the world, it will help people um, in all kinds of bangles or language to get this uh, translated properly. The simplest app I've tried so far is one called Whisper Writer. You can run it 100% of your computer. You don't need a very powerful computer, but there are options for if you're using Mac or Linux, all under the hood are using the same Whisper model that works really, really well. And it gets the punctuation right. You get the <laughs> commas and the dots that usually don't need to do that kind of but uh, post-processing. And also, if you want to try uh, local LLMs to find out whether they are able to, to create code, Python code, OpenSCAD code, or any kind of board, uh, there are several options. I'm saying here what, what are like the best multi-platform is GPT for all. You can even drop PDF, drop your own repo from GitLab. It will answer questions based on your documents. So that's really really useful. You don't require uh, any kind of GPU or something. It just works out of the box. But if you want to get a bit farther, there are some other options like LM Studio, Olama. And if you want to get down into customizing things, there is this called Tech Generation Web UI, where you can load any model on the internet and find out if it's the thing that, that works for you. And yeah, for those Spanish speakers, I'm just trying to document it in the open in Spanish. We will put all this information also in the in this uh, motherboard channel, we will publish it on the Git Cloud. We will try to distill all this information so we can keep track of what's going on in the AI world with open source and also commercial models. And that's it for me. Great, uh, thank you, Cesar. Uh, now I'm pleased. Uh, uh, in, in the upper left of your screen, you might see a pulsing star, which is Zoom's AI companion. And I'm pleased we have Chen Guang from Zoom to talk about um, uh, both. I want to share with them our use of Zoom and then talk about the uh, Zoom AI activities. So please take over. Yeah, thanks, Neil. Uh, let me. Okay. So. Uh... Thanks a lot. I'm really honored to be here to talk about our Zoom AI companion strategy. And uh, so I'm Chen Guangzhu. I'm an AI science lead uh, at Zoom. So first, a uh, quick uh, introduction of the Zoom company itself. The, the full name of Zoom is uh, Zoom Video Communication. It was founded about 13 years ago. And from the first day, it aimed at like removing the barrier of physical distance in real-time communication. And as of today, hundreds of millions of people, including you, have been uh, active users of Zoom. So while uh, many of us have been using Zoom meetings, we actually provide a suite of efficient tools beyond meetings, including but not limited to chats, mails, and recently document processing. 
And we also support various business applications such as contact centers, sales, and more. One question people often ask is, being a video communication company, why do we need AI? Actually, the short answer is absolutely yes. Because if we uh, take a step back and look at all the business scenarios we uh, serve, such as meetings, chats, and documents, they lie at the center of decision-making process of people. Think about when business executives want to reach a decision, when teachers and students discuss something important and want to uh, like have some brainstorming. These are the high-level human intelligence activities. So if we can use AI to boost, to help this, uh, this process, to facilitate this uh, thinking, reasoning, decision-making uh, for humans, it will be very, very useful. So by engineering alone, what we have already achieved is definitely we have, the, we have digitized the whole process, right? We have this amazing software to make sure the communication uh, is smooth. But only by AI, we can provide the core assistance uh, to facilitate these uh, functions. And a few years ago, these tasks had been uh, dauntingly difficult but since the advent of LLM, we have found a way to adapt this LLM to Zoom scenarios and to help uh, uh, support the scenarios. That's why we have pushed forward the Zoom AI companion feature, which is uh, this uh, <laughs> star, as Anil has mentioned. Uh, it was available back in September 2023, being the first such AI product in uh, communication software. And a big advantage of us uh, over uh, other competitors, such as uh, Teams Copilot, is that we have no additional uh, pricing, price tag for all the paid Zoom user accounts. So if you are already have, is a, are a paid Zoom user, you can uh, get this feature for free. So let's uh, take a quick tour of uh, what the Zoom AI Companion can support right now. Uh, first is uh, AI Companion questions, where you can uh, ask questions, any questions in natural language format during a meeting to the star, to this uh, assistant. And for instance, if you are late to a meeting, I often do that. You can let it do a quick catch me up. So you can summarize the meeting up to now, like before you have joined. Or you can ask it like who, uh, what had uh, Ching Wang or what had uh, uh, Nail said like, while um, I was away, uh, things like that. And after the meeting, it can provide a succinct uh, summary to the meeting. This is particularly useful when you have missed a meeting, but you want to get quickly get the gist of the meeting, including the next steps with uh, the person to execute the action, time, the item, etc. And similarly, we provide a summary to uh, chat histories. For instance, you while you're aware, there has been a long a list of reply to your uh, message. You don't have time to read all of these. So you can uh, let it summarize it for you and then even have it to compose a polished message for you. So this is an example of uh, composing messages in email. Right? If, if you want to have a draft, and also if you want to make the current draft longer or more humorous, et cetera, it can help you with that. So with that said, I want to talk about the core technology behind this amazing AI companion feature. If we take a step back and look at how traditionally tech companies choose what models to serve, we found that most of the time we choose uh, we like uh, curated a lot of uh, model candidates and then tested them on the validation data. And then we choose the model with the best performance on the validation data. But this is actually the best average performance. For instance, it could be the best accuracy on the validation data or the highest human score on the validation data, right? And we serve this single model candidate. We sometimes have A-B test but again, the goal is to serve with only one model instance 
for any user input. But what if we can choose, smartly choose the best model for every input instance by some Oracle, right? For every different user's input, we can smartly choose the best model among our uh, arsenal of models, at least approximately. So if actually we found that even for models uh, as strong as GPT-4, it doesn't have a monopoly over all the space of user in input instance. There are cases where each different model in our suite that can like achieve the best output for a single user input instance. But to do this is easier said than done because there are two obstacles. First, if we really want to choose the best model output out of all the models we have, naively, we need to run every model once for each input. Then that's too time consuming and also uh, the cost will be super high. Secondly, and I think it's more difficult, is that we don't know the quality before the user gives feedback. So a naive way would be to show every model's output to the user, get their feedback, and then show the output with the best feedback to them again. Definitely, this is not feasible. So we have a device in an approximate way that works pretty well in real scenarios. We call this a federated AI, as described in the next picture. So this is the core technology. We, uh, in it, uh, we have two central concepts. First is what we call model chain. Instead of serving only one model, we serve a sequence of models, model one, model two, and et cetera. Usually these models are sorted based on the, an increasing performance, but also at an increasing cost. So model one may cost like maybe the least costly model. Uh, the performance is relatively weaker compared with other models. And model two is a bit more expensive, but more uh, powerful or the quality is high. And the second uh, concept is called Z-scorer. This is a surrogate quality evaluator that can give a numerical score of how good it thinks the output is based on the input output pair. Right. Now, when the input comes, we first serve it with model one, the cheapest model, and it comes with an output. Traditionally, this output is directly shown to the user. But now instead of doing that, we first feed it into the Z-scorer, which comes out with the score. We compare it with a predefined threshold, T1. And if it's above T1, it means it's confident that this output could be shown to the user because the quality is good. Then we'll directly show it and end the process. Only when the score is below the threshold do we send to the next more expensive and potentially better model. And then similarly, the process goes on. The core idea of why this uh, whole process works is that because of the long tail, uh, we, found, uh, we found that uh, most of the questions are relatively easy like say, catch me up, or what are the action items? So here, the, most of the traffic, so here's an example, like 90% of the traffic is only processed by one model only, or plus a very, relatively much cheaper score. And then only a fraction, small fraction of traffic needs to be dealt with by more than one model. Therefore, the amortized cost is low. While the performance, is, is high because we have this quality assurer, right? Uh, where we only output to the user when we are confident. And in the progress, we train the models and the Z-scorer just like the way they're being used in inference during our training. So uh, each model is already accustomed to seeing the feedback from previous models in the chain and also the input. Also, the scorer is trained to be able to judge with high quality to align with human scores. But let's uh, quickly uh, take a look at the, the results. So here I'm showing the comparison between our federated AI solution 
with uh, versus uh, GPT-4 as a surrogate for Copilot. I will compare in two dimensions, cost as serving cost to us and quality in two scenarios, meeting queries or meeting questions and meeting minutes. So we'll compute the cost based on the real numbers we have in our serving clusters and also our uh, API cost or on the other words, the amount of money we need to pay to uh, open AI for our usage of the API of uh, GPT-4. As you can see, our cost is a very small fraction of uh, GPT-4, which is only a 6%, while the quality, which is being judged by GPT-4 itself, because the output of mean, both meaning query and meaning minutes are uh, in natural language, so we use GPT-4 to judge. Uh, there has been literature showing that GPT-4 or any model at LLM has a bias to label their own model's output with higher quality score. So even with that bias taken into account, we still achieve 99% and 97% of the quality score of GPT-4. So this shows that we have achieved our previously uh, set North Star, which is like a low cost and high quality. And so the, to wrap up, so uh, in this talk I show the Zoom AI company, I highly encourage uh, anyone uh, who hasn't tried this uh, to have a shot uh, and uh, also the core technology behind it. Okay, thank you very much. Great, thank you so much um, to show the thoughtful backend. And you should all know this is part of a, a, a great conversation with Zoom where we're giving them feedback on our use of it. and. For them, this is a large, global, multilingual, multi-everything um, meeting that's a good test case. So uh, this is part of an ongoing uh, collaboration with Zoom. So let me now, so if you can stop your share, um, mm -hmm. a couple notes, a few uh, final projects, and then a little bit of time for Q&A. So first, um, in the agreement students sign, we ask them to credit sources, and that includes uh, AI engines, and that includes prompts. So just a note that the role of using AI in the class is clear. You're welcome to use it, but need to identify it. Uh, one caution a few people have mentioned I want to stress is things like the electronic example of knowing which pin to connect to. It's wonderful and powerful and often wrong or sometimes wrong. So you need to be very cautious about um, a, a hallucination, generalization. You can get an answer, and a lot of the times it's right, and sometimes it's wrong. And so you really need to vet the engineering answers. Another comment is this session is focused on LLMs, but also a lot of the impact doesn't involve large language models. It also just involves optimization. So for example, uh, my student Jake has a paper coming out on a 3D printer that does instrument it to do rheology so it can learn how to print recycled and renewable materials. And that's really about search and optimization against uh, richer data. Um, uh, one more note, this recitation has largely been about things happening in the cloud. In the embedded programming week, I pointed to all of the progress in embedded AI. And so the, something like ChatGPT uses a hideous amount of energy and GPU resources. There's been a lot of work to simplify them, including what Ching Wang presented, but, or in addition, there's a lot of work to boil them all the way down to things that work on microcontrollers. Seed has been very active on that. And so through the cycle, we'll be seeing more and more of em embedded AI. Um, now I wanna come to, I'm gonna share an image on Fab Futures. So after the Fab event in uh, Bhutan, we were asked if we could help with vocational training. And what I had proposed is there was a lot of, and this is true in many parts of the world, you know, 20th or 19th century vocational training rather than 21st century vocational skills. And so I proposed using Fab Labs Academy to teach 21st century vocational skills and I gave them a menu of possible topics, like these examples on the slide from Jean-Michel, who's helping coordinate this. And we offered them these as things we could develop. And the response we got is, we want all of them. 
not, not any one of them. And so what that turned into is a class we're developing. We hope to start in the fall called Fab Futures. And it's a very different model. Fab Academy is a deep dive with a cohort. Fab Futures will be one month hands-on introductions. So in AI, in a month, you can train and use a model. In big data, you can analyze a data set. Um, in cybersecurity, you can probe and reach a vulnerability. In robotics, you can um, uh, program a robot. In microelectronics, you can make a transistor. These are one month units taught by global leaders to work groups like a Fab Academy. And it never stops and it never ends. It's a continuous uh, rolling uh, one month cycle um, that goes forever. And you can come in and join whenever you want and go off. And among these classes, the ones that really get traction um, will spin off into deeper dive classes. So this will be one follow up in AI and a number of neighboring things. Um, this was inspired by Bhutan, but we expect many sites all around the world are going to um, participate. The, you know, the, the roughly 100 sites in the Fab Academy and, and the thousands of Fab Labs. And what's particularly exciting about that is Fab Labs up until recently were defined by the laser cutter, by the tools. But as it grows from Fab Academy to Fab Academy to Bio Academy to Fab All In and now Fab Futures, it's really coming to be defined not by the tools, but by the culture and the community that we're assembling. It's a really interesting moment in the life of the network. So with that, we have just a few minutes for questions. And I wanna start, um, uh, so question about future, uh, about the cost. The way that's gonna work like all of our classes is all of the digital content is freely available. The cost is for things that consume resources. So real-time participation with the global experts and um, accreditation and evaluation, backend infrastructure, things, participation that consumes resources will cost. And the pricing is likely to vary based on the cost of the units, based on what each unit costs. The content will freely share as we do with everything that has a little incremental cost. Um, let me start with a question of Jean-Michel, which is in this Fab Academy cycle, we had started talking about uh, uh, some AI students and an AI lab, like um, the team at MIT did, but you had some broader thoughts of what we might do. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I, I thought says I would also talk about it, but we 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 spoke in the in the AI group about the idea of uh, instead signing up instead of signing up a, a student to the Fab Academy, basically making a an LLM for each week, uh, and so you you create an AI that has um, sort of hyper expertise on on one week subject. And then you can go as a student to these large language models and ask it questions. And then eventually we could even imagine a, a, a sort of a group session where we invite all these LLMs as specialists and talk through the Fab Academy as a whole, where these LLMs basically have their own um, specific knowledge. Um, and that would then eventually lead to, you know, what, what you said, Neil, is like, could you at some point obsolete yourself and then all the students as well? Uh, and, and there were other things we spoke about. I'm not entirely sure what they were anymore. I was I was focused on something else. Cesar, do you remember other other ideas that we wanted to develop instead of just just signing up a student? We were also talking about this idea of connecting mods to the real world. <laughs> like, can we connect the outputs of the LLM to the mods so we can ask a prompt, get an intermediate result we can verify, and then this could be shipped to the actual machine. And then we had the concerns about what if there's an hallucination or if the code is wrong. So we were also talking about maybe we need to have some digital twins inside mod of the laser cutter. So we can send the information to the virtual serial print and find out if the machine would return an error or not. But maybe for machines it's more complex, but we were also discussing about getting this virtual Xiao board where we can send the code to the board and it can be run and we could like test if the code is right or test if there is any kind of compilation error or so, things like that. Trying to mix the physical and the virtual. Very interesting. That touches on a couple of related things. Just I'm showing um, for Chen Guang, uh, this is mod, something I initially wrote a whole um, teams turned into a community project aimed at turning any format into anything to make on any machine. And so I love the idea of AI cloud connected to this. Now, 
Um, a few years ago, my lab was part of a, a research program to implement morphogenesis as a design principle. So search over developmental programs. And we were very constrained by the simulation engines for the digital twin, searching over the physics, the simulation engine kept breaking. And so we've done a lot of work on multi-physics modeling. Um, and uh, I'll be posting a paper shortly on that, on connecting uh, physics and modeling. Um, this uh, I'm showing, this is a class I teach uh, this is a Cambridge Press text, and these are notes for it on mathematical modeling and search and optimization. And so that's, I think that's going to be a growing part of the simulation tools around the fabrication tools. And this also touches on, Ricardo is asking a question in the chat about sheet metal forming robots, analyzing, measuring feedback. And he's asking what kind of AI they're using. And again, this is where I would distinguish um, AI is being misused to mean many different things. You know, broadly, I would connect it to cognition and language. Um, in a class like this, I cover search and optimization, which is beyond what I can do in Fab Academy. Um, it is part of, um, uh, right now I'm doing the um, uh, my occasional machine building class where we'll, we'll be doing um, some discussion of that, but this would be a great fab futurist topic. Search and optimization is given constraints and given observations, how you make something extremal. And there's a whole family of techniques for search and optimization that get used against language for large language models, but you can use in many other domains. And I wouldn't even really call that AI, it's just search and optimization. And that's a very powerful technique growing. So instead of you knowing speeds and feeds and knowing how to do path planning, the tools can learn how to do that by, by searching and optimizing. So we're up to 10 o'clock. Any final questions or thoughts? Um, let's see. Can AI create a stone it cannot lift? My version of that is in the last instructor meeting, you know, we had talked about making uh, the virtual students, and I'd say the A MIT students and the, the AI students would have gotten about a B minus. They, you know, they might have passed the class, but not with a great grade. We'll see if they get better. But then in the last instructor meeting, there was the observation, we could make the AI kneel. So turn me into, you know, I, I'm, I'm very predictable in all sorts of ways and turn me into an engine. But then that leads to the AI students could be talking to the AI Neil, and then what's left, we all go off to the beach. So um, provocative questions. Uh, it's not time to abandon learning all the things we learn because the AI systems make mistakes, but it is nibbling away at a lot of the skills we teach and really transforming them. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody who presented. Um, remarkable unfolding story. Uh, I'll collect their slides, we'll post the video, and themes from this uh, will be thread throughout the Fab Academy cycle into Fab Futures and beyond. So thank you all.